now we are ready. All right, so today we are going to talk about growing brassicas. And that is a term that may not be familiar to everyone. Um, it's a, it's a very important group of vegetables. Um, it's what often is referred to as the cabbage family. Um, and there's some other names for it. Um, so it's got a lot of vegetables that you're probably familiar with. So let's um, talk about that. So other names for the brassicas is the name of the family, the Latin name, when but uh, botanists talk about is the Brassicaceae, which is a really long and difficult to pronounce and spell uh, name. So um, typically it's just shortened to the Brassicas as a group. And besides calling it the cabbage family, sometimes it's referred to as the mustard family because it's in that family also and there's lots of different mustard plants. Um, the old name for it, and you'll see this sometimes in books, is the Cruciferae. And I don't know why they do this, but every now and then the botanist will decide to change the name of a plant, or sometimes in this case, a whole family of plants. Uh, formerly, they were called the cruciferi, and uh, because the little flowers are shaped like a, a crucifix, like a cross, and so sometimes uh, they just call them crucifers, um, or sometimes you'll still hear people refer to cruciferous vegetables, and that's all referring to the same thing members of the Brassicaceae, members of the Brassicas group that we are talking about today. And then even another older name you'll hear sometimes is coal crops, C-O-L-E. And that also refers to like, um, think like cauliflower, you can sort of see that in there, um, or coleslaw. Um, it's just an old name uh, for members of the cabbage family as well. So. Those are all interchangeable, but the, the, the common Latin term right now is the brassicas. So um, just a little bit about plant families. Um, besides the cabbage family, there's other families just to be aware of. Since you're a gardener, you probably know a lot of these. There's the bean family, which is the legumes, so peas and beans. There's the tomato family, sometimes called the nightshades. That's like tomatoes and peppers and uh, eggplant and potatoes. And of course, the cucumber and squash family is the cucurbits. Um, and then the carrot family is the umbellifers. Umbellifers, I'm sorry, the umbellifers. It's a little difficult to pronounce also. Um, and then the onion family is the alliums. So we actually have a handout sheet at Kansas City Community Gardens that shows all these vegetable plant families. It's just kind of nice to know which plants are in which families. And one of the reasons that this is important is because when you're planting, you kind of want to group your plants by family because ideally you're going to be rotating your crops, moving them around in the garden. Like for instance, your tomatoes, you would not want to plant them in the same place every year. You'd want to move them to a different place. And so they actually recommend that you group your, your garden plants by families and move the families around in your crop rotation. So like all the members of the cabbage and mustard family, the broccoli, cabbage, et cetera, cauliflower, all those, plant them near each other and then next year move them to a different place. And this is because you want to avoid buildup of insects and diseases because there's lots of specific insects and diseases that attack um, plants by their family groupings. So um, that's why it's important to know um, the different family groupings. Um, the members of the cabbage family, uh, the brassicas, uh, a lot of them are very familiar vegetables. Here's a few of the, the common ones that you're probably familiar with. Starting in the upper left-hand corner, we have broccoli, of course. Right below it, we have cabbage. That's actually a savoy leaf cabbage there. And then, of course, cauliflower. Um, over here in the center on the top, we have collard greens. And then right below that, we have Brussels sprouts. Uh, over here at the top, we have kale. And then right below that, we have radishes, and those are turnips right next to that. So those are all kind of very familiar members of the cabbage family, the brassicas. So these are all part of that group. But there's also some more unusual ones that you may not be as familiar with. Um, or if you grow lots of interesting vegetables, you might be. Um, so in this slide, we have upper left-hand corner, we have arugula, sometimes called rocket. 
Um, right below that is kohlrabi, which is a very strange looking vegetable. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Here in the center, we have a vegetable that's called Chinese broccoli. Um, it has an Asian name, which I have difficulty pronouncing. Um, right below that is another Asian um, member of the brassicas called bok choy. Uh, you've probably seen that in the grocery store. In the upper right-hand corner, we have um, Napa cabbage, um, sometimes called Chinese cabbage. And then right below that is another Asian brassica called Tatsoi. And we actually carry that one here at Kansas City Community Gardens. We have seeds for that plant. And just to let you know, there are many, many other um, Asian vegetables, unusual members, but these are just some of the more ones you're likely to see um, at the grocery store or in the seed catalogs. And there's even some members of the brassica family that are ornamental flowers. Um, you've probably seen some of these. One here on the left is sweet alyssum. Uh, it's usually white, but there's purple versions of it. Uh, this one here in the center is called Dames Rocket or Hesperus. And we actually have seeds for this one at Kansas City Community Gardens. Um, it's a biennial flower. And then this one over on the right is called um, Stocks or Mapiola. Um, you'll see this sometimes in bouquets. It's a cut flower lots of times. It really likes cool weather, does not grow very well here. Uh, or it can, but it's a little tricky to grow here. It's probably a better way to say that. In addition to um, these ornamental flowers, there's a couple members of the brassica group, which I, I don't have pictures of right now. I'll probably try to add that later. But if you've ever bought canola oil, um, that is pressed from the seeds of a member of the brassica family. Um, and also, of course, a lot of people eat mustard. Um, if you've had either yellow mustard or brown mustard, those are actually from a special mustard, different mustard plants, uh, which you don't typically see the seeds for. We have mustard greens here at Kansas City Community Gardens, but that is not the actual same mustard that they get, the yellow mustard or the brown mustard. But basically, yellow and brown mustard are just ground up seeds um, of those plants. So very interesting family of brassicas. And they're actually very diverse. Um, you know, there's lots of things like in the, the tomato family, usually you're eating the fruits, like you're eating tomatoes or peppers or eggplants. But in the brassica family, you're eating all different plant parts. And that's the definition of a vegetable is an edible plant part. So with the brassicas, sometimes you're eating leaves, like when you're eating collard greens or kale or, or even turnip greens or even cabbage or broccoli, those are all, I'm sorry, not broccoli, cabbage or, um, uh, sorry, kale, anyhow, those are all leaves that you're eating. And then um, sometimes you're eating stems, like in this lower left-hand picture, that's actually the Chinese broccoli. It has little tiny heads of broccoli on it, but really you're eating the stems here. Um, and then of course, when you're eating turnips and radishes, you're actually eating the root of a plant. And then when you're eating broccoli, this is a kind of a tricky one, you're actually eating the flower buds. Um, the flowers haven't opened. In fact, sometimes people will call me and tell me that their broccoli is flowering. It's got little yellow flowers. That's when these little buds open up. And that's a sign that you've let it go too long. It's over matured. You should have picked it sooner. You want to pick your broccoli plants, the heads, before the little flower buds actually open up. Because that's when they taste the best. So lots of different edible plant parts that you were, were eating with this family. So let's just talk a little bit about some of the common characteristics of the brassicas as a group. Um, you might call them family traits because these are things that um, most of the members of this, this family will have. Um, so one is the growing season. They are definitely cool season vegetables. They like cool weather. They don't really like hot weather. So they grow best in cool temperatures, sort of in that 40 to 70 degree range. And of course they can grow in temperatures warmer and they can grow in temperatures colder. This is just sort of the ideal growing range. Um, many of them can tolerate light freezing temperatures and some of them can survive really cold temperatures and go over the winter. We'll talk a little bit about some of those. You'll look at this picture here, you'll see some some kale, some red kale, and some green kale. 
that looks like it's just doing fine after a big snowstorm and it's not seeming to bother it at all. And again, there's, there's some that can tolerate hot summer temperatures and we'll talk about which ones are that. But in general, the best eating quality will occur when they are grown in cool temperatures. And just an example of this would be in late spring, let's say you've got broccoli planted, but you planted it a little bit late. Your broccoli is still producing a head, but you'll notice that the, the broccoli head doesn't taste as good as it does when it's been grown in cool weather. In fact, that's one of the reasons why we recommend planting broccoli in late summer for a fall garden, because then your broccoli head is maturing in the cool weather and it's higher quality. It's actually sweeter, um, not so strong tasting, and just the overall flavor is better. So um, the, the brassicas, brassicas definitely do like to grow in the cooler weather. Um, another family trait uh, would be their life cycles. Most of the brassicas, brassicas, excuse me, are biennials. And that is just the plant that it takes two years to complete this life cycle. That doesn't mean it takes two whole years. It just means it starts growing in one year and then generally goes over the winter and then completes its life cycle in the second year. Um, so it starts as a seedling year one, and then in year two, you would have flowers and then seeds eventually in the year two. Um, but that said, even though that's kind of a natural life cycle for them, that's not normally how we grow them. Generally, we're growing them as an annual because we're trying to get them in one year. In fact, a lot of them, you're not really trying to get them to go through their complete life cycle, but you're just wanting to eat the leaves. An example would be in this picture here, you'll see kale, and that's something you don't normally see is kale flowering because it doesn't flower until it's gone over the winter, until it's had a cold period. And so in this case, we had some kale plants we put under row cover, they went over the winter and um, then in the late spring, they start having little tiny flower buds, which looked like little tiny heads of broccoli, and they were edible. Um, and then they start having the yellow flowers. So normally at that point, they're not growing very many leaves, and so it's not really worth keeping them around. In this case, we kept them around because we wanted to see what it looked like. And it was interesting because they were very popular with the bees, because at that time of the year, there wasn't a lot else blooming, and the bees were just all over that. So it was good forage for the bees. Um, and then the, you know, again, the flower buds and the flowers themselves are edible. So if you want to add something interesting to your salad, you can use them. Um, but generally most brassicas, you're just trying to grow them as an annual. You're trying to do that in one year because flowering is generally considered undesirable um, other than you know, um, you know, broccoli and cauliflower. You're trying to get flower buds, but not let them completely go to flower. So. Another family trait is a group. Um, brassicas are moderate or to heavy feeders, meaning that the, the fertilizer requirements are a little bit, at least medium to high. Um, and I would say overall, the brassicas respond well to nitrogen. If you're not familiar with fertilizers, there's three main fertilizers, nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, the three main plant nutrients that plants use in the largest amounts. There's other nutrients, of course, they need, but those are the big three. So if you're ever looking at a fertilizer package and you see three numbers like 12, 12, 12, or 12, 6, 6, that first number would be the percentage of nitrogen. And so if, if you're using a fertilizer that has some nitrogen in it, your brassicas will grow bigger and stronger and healthier um, you'll get bigger leaves, you'll get bigger heads if you're trying to grow cabbage or, or broccoli. It is important to remember that you need to have enough water in order for plants to take up the fertilizer. And the other thing to be aware of is that organic fertilizer is preferable because it provides a slow release of the nitrogen. It's not just all at once. In a chemical fertilizer, that nitrogen is available pretty quick and then it's gone. And sometimes it's too much at once. It's like sort of the equivalent of um, like eating a cup full of sugar as opposed to like um, eating an apple. You get, with the apple, you get slow sugar, you get slow energy that's spread out over a long period of time with a teaspoon or a cup full of sugar, a cup full of sugar would be a lot. 
um, you get a big jolt of energy, but then it's gone and it's kind of hard on your system, obviously. So organic fertilizers provide that slow release of the nitrogen. Here you can see one of our, our favorite gardeners, Roger, who is an expert at growing large brassicas and he grows big collard plants, huge Brussels sprouts plants and huge cabbage plants. This is his cabbage harvest from last year. And you can just see how big some of those cabbages were like 10 or 12 pounds. And um, he's really successful at growing because he uses fertilizer. Um, another family characteristic of the brassicas is they're all pretty susceptible to a couple of different pests that both happen to be caterpillars. Uh, the one on the left there is called the imported cabbage worm because it came from some other country, obviously. Um, and it starts out, um, you'll see white moss, if you ever, or in this case, I'm sorry, not moss, they're actually butterflies. So in the springtime, you'll see white butterflies floating around, and lots of times they're landing on your cabbage or your broccoli or your collards, and you think, oh, this is wonderful, I have butterflies in my garden. Well, the bad news is that they lay eggs, and they turn into these caterpillars, the one right below it, the imported cabbage worm. And they are just really, really hungry caterpillars that will eat lots of holes in your brassica plants. And it doesn't seem to matter what kind, they love them all. Um, and then of course, the other one is called the cabbage looper. And the reason it's called the looper is because it does this inchworm type thing where it kind of hitches itself up and that's how it, it moves as, it, as it's walking along. Um, it inches its way along, it makes this little loop and so they're called cabbage loopers, but it also is a very hungry caterpillar. And then it actually is, uh, the parents of that would be this moth here, the, the, the looper moth that you see there on the right, which is a brown moth and it's a night flying moth. So you won't typically see that, but you will see the caterpillars and they'll be eating holes in your leaves. So it really doesn't matter which one you have or both of them. They are very destructive and eat lots of holes in your cabbage, broccoli, collards, cauliflower, all those plants. And so we'll talk a little bit about how you can control that a little bit later when we talk about growing the brassicas. And then a, a last characteristic I will mention here, family trait is that as a group, they are very high in nutrition. The nutrition value is very high and they just have some, a lot of other health benefits. Um, you know, they have lots of fiber, um, which is important uh, to get enough fiber. Also, it's just rich in vitamins and minerals, like vitamin C, B9, uh, it's got potassium, selenium. And then there's something called phytochemicals. You'll hear this term lots of times. Um, phytochemicals, the phyto means plant. So it means plant-based chemicals. These are chemicals that occur naturally inside the plant. These are compounds. And they are, there's many of them that are really important to our overall health. And a lot of them help us fight off diseases. Um, and one of the ones that's in the, the group of the brassicas is this thing called glucosinolates, uh, which are a group of compounds that looks like it helps to fight off cancer. Um, they're still doing lots of research on it, but much of the evidence, much of the results are showing that this actually helps reduce the cost no, not cost, reduce the likelihood that you will contract cancer. So obviously um, there's lots of things in many different vegetables that are super healthy for us. And I would say right now, science is just beginning to learn about lots of this type of stuff. Um, but as a group, um, it cannot be overstated how important and um, important to your health, the, the brassicas or the cruciferous vegetables as a group. All right, now we're gonna talk about how to grow the brassicas. Um, we're gonna talk about timing for planting because we talked about the fact that they are cool seasons. So that means we're gonna plant them at certain times of the year. Um, you're not gonna plant them, for instance, in May because May is like when you're coming into hot summer and that would not be a good time. Um, so they're cool seasons. So I recommend to you follow the planting calendar guidelines. Um, we have a planting calendar that we have available online. We have paper copies available here in our office. Um, you'll see it here. But the thing to remember about the brassicas, um, because they are cool season, 
essentially you can try to get two different crops per year because we have a cool spring season if you plant in early spring and we have a cool fall season. Uh, but the, the fall season is a little bit tricky because you're actually planting in the late summer to get the plants started and then they finish up, they mature during the cool season of the, the fall weather. So um, here's a little close up of the planting calendar. And if you've never used this, you kind of want to look at it, for instance, like um, if you look right here at cabbage, in parentheses, you will see uh, plants. And so that means that you're not going to plant cabbage seeds, you're going to be planting them as plants. Um, if you see something like on the, the beets, for instance, you don't see the word plants, um, that shows you you're planting seeds. On um, the planting calendar, if you see the, the word plants in parentheses, that means it's recommended that you plant plants. Um, so for cabbage plants, um, it talks about March 20th to April 20th. So that's your planting window and that's in the spring. And that will give your cabbages enough time to mature to get ahead before it gets too warm. It will start getting warm towards the end of that. But most of the growing will be done in the cooler weather of the early spring. And then right under that date of March 20th to April 20th, you'll see July 20th to August 5th. And this is in late summer um, or midsummer, and it's a time for planting the plants for fall gardens. So it seems kind of tricky because it's going to be hot right then, and we know they don't like hot weather. But basically, you're just trying to get them through a little bit of the hot weather and get them established so that when the cooler weather comes in September, um, they will be ready and growing, and they'll have enough time to make a head before it gets really, really cold and they will stop growing. So um, you pretty much see very similar um, timing on plants for like broccoli, <coughs> um, collards, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. Although Brussels sprouts are a little bit different, we'll talk about them because they have a really long growing season. But I do recommend this planting calendar to you. Again, it's available on our website. It's also available in our office. Um, I don't recommend uh, the planting calendar, you might hear about the Farmer's Almanac. Um, a, a lot of that is planting by the moon and it's got some really strange cycles down there. Um, the other thing is it's really kind of like trying to do big regions at the whole time, whereas this is very specific to the Kansas City area. So these are dates that have been developed by the University of Missouri Extension Service over years and years. And that doesn't mean you can't plant a little bit outside these windows and be successful. Sometimes the weather just works out. Um, like this year right now, it's a little bit early, um, but right now the weather looks pretty good. You could probably actually put the cabbage plant out, the broccoli plant out, even though it's not quite time, a few more days until now, till the planting time is considered correct. But you could probably get by with it this year because it looks like the weather is pretty good. But the planting calendar will help you uh, know the best times for planting. All right, another question that comes up when you're going to grow your brassicas, do you plant that seed or plant, just like we were talking about. So here's the ones that you definitely want to start from the plants. So you need to either buy plants or grow your own. You can grow your own under lights, it's possible. We did a class about that earlier, if you want to go back and look at that. But most people prefer just to go ahead and buy the plant. So things like broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, uh, Napa cabbage. These are all candidates for planting from a plant. If you planted a seed for broccoli, it would not grow fast enough in time to get you ahead of broccoli before it got too hot. Um, so it just would not work. Or if you planted it for fall, um, it wouldn't have time to grow that head of broccoli if you just plant a seed before it got too cold. So those are why reasons why you want to plant the plants. Other things, Pretty much you would be planting them from seeds um, because they're faster growing. In some cases, they don't really like transplanting like turnips. Um, they don't transplant very well because it's a root crop. But radish, turnips, the top soy, the arugula, mustard greens, these are all examples of ones that do really well just from seed. You don't, you're not gonna go buy plants. Um, although one time I will tell you, I saw radish plants I had a nursery for sale and it was just the goofiest thing ever because radish plants take about uh, 
three to four weeks to grow. And so that meant they were already growing in the pots for at least two weeks. And um, A, it cost a lot of money and all you got out of it was like four radishes. So it just seemed kind of silly. Much easier just to put out seeds. And then there's a few plants that you can actually do either or. You can start um, them from seeds or you can do plants. Some people like the, the plants just because it seems easier because the seeds are kind of tiny and you worry about are they going to sprout or not. And then you have to thin them. So there's that. And they take longer. But um, so the plants, people do like that lots of times because they're faster. You don't have to thin them. Uh, you're not working with the tiny little seeds. So there's advantages to planting the plants. Obviously, you have the cost of those. Um, but collards, kale, and kohlrabi all can be planted directly in the ground for seeds, from seeds, or you can plant them from plants that you purchased at a greenhouse. All right, let's talk about how to fertilize the grass because we talked about the importance of nitrogen fertilizer. Here at Kansas City Community Gardens, we have um, a organic fertilizer that we offer that's actually made from chicken manure. It's not just the same as, um, like if you went and bought a bag of chicken manure or if you had chickens, because um, one that's already been composted and it's been compressed into little pellets. And so it gives you a definite formula that's approximately 5% um, nitrogen, which is fairly high for an organic fertilizer. Um, but that's what we have available here at Kansas City Community Gardens. You can you get some free with your membership, or you can buy extra bags if you need more. Um, the, the product on the right there is a liquid organic fertilizer. Um, it's called Age Old Grow. Um, you used to be able to get it in nurseries and garden centers. I haven't seen it much lately. Um, but there's other ones. Again, if I do recommend using organic fertilizers because just because they're slow release and I think the plants do better. But if your cabbage and broccoli plants seem to be going kind of slow, you could get a liquid fertilizer and mix it up with some water, put it into a watering can and water, and that would help push your, your brassica plants along and help them to grow. The chicken manure fertilizer Typically, you'd be putting that down when you plant and mix it in with the soil, and then it would be available slowly over a period of time. Um, the, so again, the, the liquid one you can add later if it just seems like the plants aren't doing as well as they should be. All right, let's talk about insect control. We talked earlier about the, as a group, the brassicas are very susceptible to those two um, caterpillars, the imported cabbage, uh, worm and the cabbage looper. Um, and if you look at this picture in the center, you can see what happens. This is a collard plant, and it is just riddled with holes that were caused by caterpillars just chopping away at the leaves over a long period of time. Now, this is what happens if you do nothing. If you, if you see a little bit of damage, yeah, you can actually pick off the caterpillars and squash them or whatever, um, get rid of them, and that will help. Sometimes it's hard to do that when they're very little, and so you don't see it until it gets too late. You need to be watching your plants on a regular basis to see if it's happening, if you start seeing little holes appearing. Uh, there are some chemical controls, some organic controls that you can use um, that will help um, get rid of the, the caterpillars, will kill them. And uh, the one on the upper left is a product that's called BT. Um, this one, the brand name is Safer. They, they also make a, a soap product. It's a chemical insecticide. Um, they're just calling it Caterpillar, but it's, it's based on this product called BT, which is a bacterial product. And what it is, it's a bacteria that actually affects the feeding habits of caterpillars. And so it kind of paralyzes their stomach so they can't continue to feed. They just stop feeding and they die. Um, the, the really great thing about the BT is that it only affects members of the caterpillar family. It does not affect bees, um, does not affect other beneficials, won't hurt cats, dogs, people. So it's a very safe material to use. Um, you can get the ones that are certified organic if you're an organic farmer or whatever. So it really is a good product. That's a liquid version of BT. Right below it, there's a dust version that you can buy. 
we sell this here at the community gardens um and it comes as a garden dust and so you could sprinkle it out in the dust form um on your on your brassica plants and that will help stop the caterpillars from feeding um there is another product over here on the right that's an organic control this particular brand name is called captain jack's um dead bug brew killer and it is um relatively new on the market uh it's based on a, an organic material called spinosin, um, which if you read about it, it is similar in some ways to the DT. It's a natural organism that affects um, caterpillars and will kill them. So um, either one works really well. Um, and so this version right here, it comes in a ready to use version. You don't have to mix it up with water or anything and you can just spray it right on your plants and um, it's real easy to use, obviously. Um, there is still another way to keep out those um, moths and butterflies that lay the eggs on the cat caterpillar, uh, excuse me, on the cabbage, broccoli, all the other brassicas. Um, and that is to put row cover over them. And if you're not familiar with row cover, it's a material we use sometimes in the spring and sometimes in the fall to protect plants from cold but it also just acts like a screen and screens out the, um, the moss and the butterflies so they can't lay their eggs on your grass plants. And so it can be really helpful. Um, here you see some plants, looks like some mustard plants or some Asian greens growing under some row cover. And so the, the weather underneath there, it's almost like a little miniature greenhouse that makes them grow faster and bigger um, and, and lusher they just look very lush and vigorous um but also they've not been attacked by the caterpillars and so they look in much better shape than if for instance you had a bunch of uh, moths or butterflies laying eggs in the plastic so anyhow um the row cover works also good as an insect exclusion <clears throat> another um interesting thing about brassicas is that some of them can actually be overwintered which means you can plant them in late fall, later in the fall, cover them up with row cover, and then have them go over the winter and survive in good shape. If the two best candidates for this, this overwintering would be kale and collard greens, because they are the hardiest. And they, they will actually survive a winter, lots, lots of times, often they'll survive a winter without the row cover. But usually if they do, the leaves don't look very good. They're, they've been damaged by the cold, and they don't look like something you'd want to eat. So that the row cover will help keep the leaves in good shape so that you can go out and actually pick them. In our special garden here at Kansas City Community Garden, we have um, the Beanstalk Children's Garden where we have you know, children come in for tours in the summer and the fall. And um, we have special events in there. And one of the things we did late in the fall last year was plant some kale. And then we covered it up with row cover and kept it covered up all winter long. And so I went out to check on it and I actually went out every single month of the fall and winter and now it's spring and harvested some kale um, that was edible and ready, looked good, ready to eat and also no insect damage. Um, did that in uh, November, did it in December, did it in January, in February and in March. So, um, Kale and collards are actually probably almost the only vegetables that you could eat from your garden fresh every single month of the year because you can actually eat them during the summer. They don't grow their fastest because it's warm, but they both tolerate summer heat. So if you're looking for some year-round nutrition, um, kale and collards are the best. They are the hardiest. They can take the most heat. And they're obviously super nutritious. So um, you really recommend trying overwintering some of them, um, you know, next next year, plant some in the late fall, or actually be this year in the fall, and then cover them up with row cover and enjoy the harvest over the winter. All right, now we're gonna talk about some individual members of the brassica family. Um, just to give you a little details on that, they all have their own characteristics. We talked about the, the group characteristics, the family characteristics they share. Um, 
but let's just talk about them specifically. So broccoli, um, again, we know you're going to want to put plants out, not try to start in seeds. And you want to pick that head when the buds are still tight. If you look at this picture, you'll see how the little tiny buds, the flower buds on the broccoli are very tight and they're not large and expanded. They're not starting to open up. Um, so, I mean, actually it's okay for them to be large. You just don't want them to be tight and opening up. So, and when you cut the broccoli head, uh, you know, make sure you're not cutting it too early. I know sometimes people, they're just not sure how big it's going to get. Uh, but generally, if a broccoli plant is big, you'll get a big head. And so you might get like a, a five inch, a six inch. With some of the bigger varieties, you get, might get an eight inch or 10 inch head of broccoli, which is very large. So if you just cut your little broccoli heads and it's only three inches across, you might be um, cutting out um, some of the size that you would be having from letting it get a little larger. But again, you don't want it to start um, opening up and flowering. So you just got to kind of learn how to watch them. They are very sensitive to heat. When broccoli in the late spring, when it starts getting hot, that starts that acceleration of the flowering. And so then they're not good for eating. And also it just cuts down on the production. Um, to control the worms, the caterpillars, we talked about that, the BT or the spinosad. Um, there's also kind of an unusual thing about broccoli. It does like cold weather, but if you plant it too early and it gets too much cold, and when I say cold, I'm talking about temperatures in the 20s, um, you could take the light frost, you know, 31, 30, 29, even 28. Uh, but if you get too much of like the middle 20s, like 25, it triggers something in the broccoli to make it flower or, or you know, have its head early. But instead of having a big head, it will have a little head about the size of the quarter, which is not very big. It's not, it's really disappointing when that happens because it just gets that big and it never gets any bigger. And that is called buttoning uh, because it gets the size of a button or a quarter or whatever. And um, it just happens in certain years when we have too much really cold weather after you plant your broccoli. There you see the planting time, March 20th uh, to April 10th. Uh, for plants, and then again for plants starting July 25th through August 5th. So not a big planting window for the fall gardens, but still um, really good time to be planting because that fall broccoli is going to be very, very high quality. The other thing is when you cut that main central shoot, most varieties will then have little tiny heads that come out from the side branches, and they'll pop up, and those are called side shoots. And that will keep your broccoli going for a while, um, which is nice to have a little more than just the one big head. Uh, but then as the weather gets hotter and the days get longer, um, then the, the plants you know, don't do as well and the quality of the tasting of those side shoots is not good. Some people will tell me, oh yeah, I had broccoli go all summer, but um, it's not very good quality in July for sure. You know? Cabbage, again, you want to plant plants out. It's easier than just starting from seeds. Um, I have a lot of people who have difficulty in growing uh, the red cabbage here. Uh, we have a variety that does pretty good called the Red Express, but uh, red cabbage is just slower and it needs a little more fertilizer. Um, and if you think about it, the leaves are red and not so green, so they're not quite as efficient at photosynthesizing. So that's why it's difficult, more difficult to grow the red cabbage. Um, you got to control those cabbage worms again. And if you let the head go too long and sit too long without harvesting, um, and then you have some rain, lots of times it'll split that head right open. And that doesn't mean you can't eat it, but it means if you don't pick it and use it right away, it will start to rot. So um, you want to avoid that, of course. There are different kinds of cabbages besides the green and the red. There's one called Savoy, and that's this one here. And all that means is you hear the term like a Savoy leaf. Uh, you'll hear that sometimes on cabbage, sometimes you'll hear it on spinach. That means it's got a little bit of wrinkle to it as opposed to like a smooth leaf. And it's just a, a description of what the leaf looks like. So some people like the Savoy cabbage better. Um, I don't know if it tastes that much different. Um, some people think it's easier to grow because it's less seems less susceptible to insects. 
Again, there's the planting time that March 20th, to April 20th, uh, fall, July 20th to August 5th. Cauliflower is definitely better from transplants. Um, try to get plants that aren't too old. Um, sometimes if you are late in the season and you're picking up cauliflowers at the nursery or the, you know, the greenhouse or wherever, if they've been in their container too long, that doesn't work very well for cauliflower. They'll go ahead, excuse me, and uh, start making their heads too early and not have full size heads. Um, temperatures also, as, as we get hot temperatures, they're more susceptible to broccoli. The other thing that's interesting about um, cauliflower is, you know, their head is the white part, right? And there's some different ones now. That I think there's some orange ones and some purple ones. Um, but generally, people are growing the white ones. You actually want to cover those leaves up to protect them from the sun. If you don't, they will turn kind of purple on you and the quality will not be good, which is different than the purple um, cauliflower because it's not supposed to turn purple. That's, in this case, it would be something from the sun. Um, so what they do is they talk about um, blanching, which just means protecting it from the sun. And um, some cauliflower varieties are considered self blanching which means the top leaves kind of fold over the top of the head. Uh, but even recommended still would be to uh, cover them up with the leaves. So you take the very top leaves good sized one and kind of pull them over and cover up that little head of cauliflower as it's starting to grow and then um, fasten it with like a closed pin. And that will make it stay shut. And that will make a little tent over that little head of cauliflower as it gets bigger and protect it from the sun and make sure that it stays white. So it will have good taste and good quality. Um, cauliflower just can be challenging to grow here because sometimes, like I say, our summer gets too hot or it comes too early, or if you're planting for fall, sometimes it just stays warm too long, and it's difficult to grow the cauliflower. Excuse me. So similar planting times to the broccoli and the cabbage. Collards, um, sometimes referred to as collard greens. Um, it's actually a, a relative of cabbage. In fact, a lot of these plants actually came from the same Plant, a plant called Brassica olerica, and it's just different varieties of the same plant for different purposes. Over the over the years, you know, for the cabbage, for the broccoli, for the cauliflower, for the collards. So think of collards as kind of like a cabbage that does not make a head, uh, and it's just eaten for the leaves. So you can plant the seeds out, or you can plant put out plants. Um, you can pretty much plant it almost any time during the growing season. I think it does best in the spring, planting in the early spring, or planting in late summer for fall gardens. Um, excuse me, and then you're gonna pick the leaves from the bottom. In fact, these are older plants right here. You can see them. And um, the gardener who's been growing them has been picking the leaves up and just keep growing and picking them up, picking them up, and it keeps getting taller and taller. You've got this long stalk. It's actually kind of similar to the stalk you will see on a Brussels sprout plant. Um, but it's got, um, you know, leaves just keep going up the stalk and keeps on growing. You never want to pick too many off at once because it needs those leaves to make energy to keep on growing. So if you pick them all off, it would weaken the plant. But if you always leave some of the growing at the top and just pick the bottom ones as you go along before they get too big and tough, then um, they'll just keep on going. So, and again, this is one of the two along with kale that's very, very cold hardy. And you can, even without real cover, you can often just harvest them right up to almost Thanksgiving time. Uh, but if you do row cover them over the winter, then you can get them where you can harvest them in December and January and February and on into the next spring. But usually both kale and collard, by the time next spring rolls around the end of spring, they'll start to flower and grow the seed. So then they, they slow down because they're completing their life cycle. Kale, um, similar to collards. Um, there's lots of different kinds of kale. There's some smooth leaf ones. 
There's some red leaf ones, some purple ones. Um, there is a, a variety called Tuscan kale, um, which has kind of a wrinkly leaf. Sometimes it's called dinosaur kale. Um, so different people have different kale preferences of what they like. Um, this is just a regular green kale here. Um, you can plant them from seeds or from transplants. You'll get earlier leaves if you put out plants. Um, and very cold hardy, again, as we mentioned, can be overwintered. Can, leaves can be picked all spring and all summer because it will tolerate. It doesn't grow very fast in the summer. It's like collards, but it will tolerate. Um, again, you'll have problems with the, the caterpillars. So you want to keep those under control, especially if you're going to try and carry them on through the winter. So plants in the winter, um, you don't want them to be too big. So Generally for, for fall garden, you'll be planting kale like at the end of July, beginning of August. For overwintering, I would plant them more like uh, September 10th or so, put new plants out then, and then you know start row covering them in October and letting them grow under that row cover. And then you'll be able to harvest over the winter, um, throughout the winter, in fact. All right. I'm gonna make sure I just didn't skip when I did. All right, arugula. Arugula is kind of a, a, for a lot of people, it's a newer one. It's not as well known. It's grown just for the leaves. Uh, lots of times it's mixed in with salads or if you buy microgreens. Um, it's really very tasty. It grows fast. It's best if you eat them while they're young. All the arugula leaves get really strong, um, real strong mustard taste or a skunky taste sometimes, kind of hot and spicy. Uh, in not a good way. It works best just to plant the seeds out directly. Uh, if you plant the, them in a, in a container and try and grow it in a, in a pot, um, they, they go to flower too early and they go to seed too early. So better just plant out seeds. Um, this doesn't actually have as much problem with the caterpillars. It's a little unique. It has problems with flea beetles. If you're not familiar with them, they're very tiny little beetles that are actually not as small as the flea, but they are very small and they jump like a flea, but not related to fleas. But they can be a problem with the arugula. So again, similar planting dates. Um, the best thing about arugula is you wanna just keep on picking it as the leaves get to a nice size picket. So you keep it growing and keep it growing and keep it growing. And then once, once summer gets in, it pretty much is done because it's going to flower and then plants them again in late summer for fall. All right, Napa cabbage, um, sometimes called Chinese cabbage. Um, this is the main type of cabbage that is grown in Asian countries. They don't grow our regular cabbage that we um, have here, the regular round cabbage. And these are more tall and upright. Um, again, best from transplants, they grow very fast. But this is, yeah, the traditional cabbage for all Asian cooking. Um, the reason it's called Napa cabbage sometimes is because it was originally grown a lot in the Napa Valley in California because it's a good climate for it there. But you can grow it just fine here. Um, it has different insect problems. It's more like arugula. It has problems with the flea beetles, the little black ones that jump around, um, that eat tiny holes. So that could be a challenge. But they typically do not get um, the caterpillars as much as the other types of cabbage. So. If you haven't tried it, it's really great. Try it in stir fry or if you're making homemade egg rolls or other Asian dishes. Um, it's really, really tasty. And it's real easy to grow. The other thing is it's super expensive. If you buy it in the grocery store, you can buy a cabbage and you might spend like five or six dollars for one cabbage because they're usually pretty big and pretty heavy. And you're but paying it for by the pound. Um, so it's definitely worth it if you like them to grow your own. Brussels sprouts. Um, Brussels sprouts are, um, a lot of people don't care for Brussels sprouts. Maybe they didn't like them as a child and never learned to like them as an adult. I have learned to like them as an adult, did not like them as a child. Um, if you look at a Brussels sprout, it actually looks like a miniature little cabbage head. And that's essentially what they are. And they grow on this long stalk. So the challenge with Brussels sprouts is you need a really long growing season in order to get this long tall stock. And 
um, over the summer, they don't grow very strong because it's too hot. And there's lots of caterpillars out there. So it's a challenge to keep them off. Um, so you have to keep putting on the, the organic insect control, the dipel dust that we talked about, or the captive jacks, and just keep doing it you know, on a regular basis to keep them off. So essentially what you're trying to do is in the spring, start to grow a big stalk, a big tall stalk. So you're gonna keep putting fertilizer on it, keep fertilizing, keep watering all spring and through the summer and get a really tall plant. And as the plant gets taller, you do wanna remove some of the lower leaves so that the little Brussels sprouts will be able to form easily because they form Everywhere where there's a leaf, that's where it, one of those new ones is formed. It's almost like it's a, a leaf bud, if that makes sense. And so, um, again, you want to grow a big, tall plant, but you don't want to remove all the leaves. So this person here has removed a lot of the lower leaves, and it's gradually got taller and taller. But it has a nice big grouping of leaves up on top, so it can make energy for making those Brussels sprouts. And then in the fall, when the weather gets cool, uh, even after frost, is when Brussels sprouts get the best. Um, the sugars accumulate, they taste sweeter, and um, they're getting nice size. We, are, again, are not in good Brussels sprouts growing country because of the hot summer. In places like Maine, uh, on the upper uh, east, west coast, the Pacific Northwest, like um, Seattle area, Washington, um, Oregon, um, Northern California, those are all great places for growing fossil sprouts. Um, it's a little bit harder here because of the hot summer, but you can do it. Mustard and turnips, uh, we've got them grouped here together, typically grown for greens, although of course turnips have the bottoms. Um, it's one of the earliest things you can plant. You can sprinkle those seeds out there and even if it's too cold and it's snowy, it's not gonna hurt them. They just wait a little bit longer. Um, the seeds are tiny, so we just say sprinkle them lightly over the soil and then cover them very lightly or make a little trench and sprinkle them in a little tiny trench about a quarter of an inch deep, an eighth of an inch deep, and then cover them lightly and sprinkle them um, lightly to get them to sprout. And then you need to thin them out because if you sprinkle the seeds out, lots of times there's too many coming up and they crowd each other. And that will reduce the size of the leaves. If you thin them out to say three to six inches, the plants will have enough room, they'll get larger, they'll have bigger leaves, and better greens. Um, but as soon as it starts to get hot, they go to seed. They flower first, they have yellow flowers, and then they go to seed. And that's called bolting. Um, bolting is just a, a nickname for the process where the plant, you know. But it's, I guess it's bolting, it means it's hurrying to go to flower and then to seed in the sense that it's doing it before it's supposed to. Um, the other thing is um, like the Chinese cabbage, the Napa cabbage and the um, arugula, it can be uh, attractive to the flea beetles. Um, not so much the, cab with the caterpillars, but the flea beetles have problems with the mustard and turnips. But the, the greens are very nutritious. Um, they'll keep coming until it gets too hot and then they'll slow down. So. There's also some Asian mustards. There's also some pretty red leaf mustards that are, are great. All right, radishes. Um, you know, radishes are actually kind of one of the interesting vegetables that like people who started gardening when they were young, their parents gave them a package of radish foods to plant because they grow very fast. Usually in just like three to four weeks, you'll get a full size radish. And you can even buy some that come in different colors. We have some in our children's uh, garden, the beanstalk seeds that we sell. Um, it's called Easter egg that comes in different colors. And if you let them get a little bigger, they'll look like they're the size of an Easter egg. If you put them on. Um, they germinate fast. They're ready to eat at the beginning when they're the size of a marble. You don't want them to become too large. Then they get to be about the size of a ping, ping pong ball, which is a good eating size. But beyond that, they may get larger, but they aren't necessarily good to eat. The quality goes down. So there's actually some varieties that are ready even faster, like in only 21 days. So just to give you an idea, that's probably the fastest growing vegetable 
in the garden. And if you let them stay too long, they also get very hot, spicy, and don't taste as good. They are milder, which I consider a good thing. Um, if you pick them while they're small and, and fresh and not so large. Um, actually, let me go back to radish. So this is the typical shape you see in the grocery store and typically they'll be red. That's why it's fun to grow your own because you can have a different color, but there's also some different shapes. There's some that look like little white carrots um, called icicle um, radishes. There's some that are longer and red. There's called the French breakfast radishes. Um, and then there's some Asian radishes um, called daikon, D-A-I-K-O-N, uh, that actually get large and they get like maybe, I don't know, 10 or 12 inches long and very large and they're used lots of times in stir fry. They're a little bit trickier to grow, uh, but again, they like the cooler weather also. Um, so those are very, very interesting vegetables if you're interested in trying some of that. And then kohlrabi, we, we showed this earlier. It's just not very well known, but it's, it's a brassica. You can tell by the leaves. What's interesting is it kind of looks like sort of a turnip, um, but it's like a turnip that's sitting on top of the ground. So the other thing, some people say it looks kind of like a little spaceship or it's like something from outer space. Uh, very different looking vegetable. Um, you want to pick them while they're relatively small, meaning probably about the size of a turnip. Uh, there are some varieties that say they taste mild and don't get um, tough, um, and they'll get even up to six inches or 10 inches, and um, I, I believe that, um, but the varieties that we have are more typical, and um, you want to eat them when they're small, somewhere about the size of a ping pong ball to the size of a turnip. Um, so not too large. You can use them in salads. You can make slaw with them using the stir fries so they can be eaten fresh or cooked and uh, just something different you know so if you're adventurous I recommend that you try it and then here's one that we mentioned earlier too it's called tatsoi it's an Asian green um, if you look like the little tiny miniature leaves it looks kind of like that pak choy that we talked about so obviously similar um, but small with little tiny leaves Good in stir fries. You can use them in salads too. Um, best when they're young. You don't want them to get too old and too large. They get too hot and too spicy, too mustardy tasting. Easy to grow. Um, again, plant them from seeds. Plant them in the spring and again in late summer for fall. And then the last plant we're going to look at here is a little bit different, but many people are familiar with it, is horseradish. <coughs> Excuse me. And what's different about horseradish is that it's a perennial vegetable. Like all these other ones we talked about, um, the, the brassicas, they're all biennial. Or effectively, we grow them as annuals because they happen in one year. This horseradish is something that you plant as a root, and then it grows and just keeps going year after year after year. The danger with horseradish is it will take over a garden space. I do not recommend planting it in with your other vegetables. It would be better to find a separate little spot somewhere off, <coughs> preferably surrounded by some lawn, because it won't take over your lawn, but if you mow the grass around it, it won't take over your whole garden. So um, it's better to have it in kind of an isolated place. And again, the other thing is, do you even like horseradish? I will confess, it's not my favorite. It's a little bit too strong. The sauce is just too hot and spicy for me. Um, but a lot of people, um, are big fans, and so if you are so inclined, have at it. It's really easy to grow. You just need to buy the roots and plant them, generally in the spring or in the late fall. <coughs> okay, so that is our discussion. Um, Want to see if we have some questions that people have sent in? Yeah, we got a couple, Ben. I'm going to send them to your email right now. Okay, let me go gather that.
Okay, two questions. All right, let's go back to our slides. Um, the first question is the broccoli rab or rab. It's um, it's what they call sprouting broccoli. Let me get back to the PowerPoint here. Um, in fact, let me just go back a little bit. Um, yeah, it, it's similar in some ways to this, this Chinese broccoli we talked about. Um, uh, broccoli rab um, is called sprouting. It has many, many small heads. Um, which is nice. You see, you just get lots of little small heads that you can use. And it is a member of the brassica family, of course. Um, the, the stalks aren't generally considered quite as sweet and tender as the Chinese broccoli. That's the advantage of that. Uh, but, you know, it, um, you could use it very similar. Um, you could use the stalks in the same way along with the little tiny heads. Um, and then the other question, um, if I can remember correctly, Rob, was, Will the BT hurt bees? Is that correct? Uh, monarchs. Oh, the monarchs. Okay, sorry. Um, monarchs. Okay, that is a very good question. So um, BT is, again, it will kill members of the caterpillar family. So if you sprayed it on plants that were hosting monarchs, it would affect them. But um, you're only going to use it on members of the brassica family. And see, the good thing about much of the, the members of the, the butterfly family is that they are very specific as to what plants they eat. So monarchs do not eat members of the brassica family. They eat members of the, uh oh, this is escaping me for a second, uh, the milkweed family. Thank you. Um, so that's why everyone's so interested in planting milkweeds because that is the plant that monarchs choose to lay their eggs on. And there's many different kinds of milkweed. It's a whole family all by itself. And so there'd be no reason why you would want to spray BT on milkweeds um, because yeah, you would not want to hurt the monarchs. But if you spray BT on your members of the cabbage family, it's only going to hurt those caterpillars and the, the, the associated butterflies and moths that lay their eggs on them. Um, that on the brassica. So it's very specific by family. So you don't have to worry about hurting monarchs when you're using BT, as long as you're not spraying it on your milkweed plants, so your flowering milkweeds or, or other milkweeds that maybe are you're hoping to you know, host for the monarch plants. Um, I think maybe that's the only two questions we had. Um, if you do get more questions, like something might occur to you later, you can actually send them to us. And we have an email for questions, it's just contact, C-O-N-T-A-C-T, -T, at kccg.org. And you can post questions to us there. Um, sometimes you can send questions via a Facebook message too, and Rob will pick them up there. Uh, but we're happy to answer questions and um, always want to be of help as you plant your garden. So the good news about these brassicas is it's going to be time to plant them starting next week. And right now, it looks like the 10-day forecast is good. Um, that does not mean that we still could not have some very severe weather. I was actually looking at um, my phone, you know, how sometimes it will show you pictures from last year. And it looked like in April, we had a snow last year, which is after the planting time for cabins of broccoli. And uh, I don't think it was cold enough that it killed them all outright. Uh, but it was, you know, a little bit of a shock. Um, so sometimes, even if it's you're planting by the planting calendar, we can still get unusually cold weather um, after that. And sometimes you might want to think about having some row cover on hand to cover them up and protect them in case we get severe cold. But looks like next week we got a clear forecast for planting um, all the brassicas and all the other cool season vegetables like spinach and lettuce and all those other good things, potatoes and onions. So um, if you haven't been to the Kansas City Community Gardens, I recommend you come visit us 
and go to our website and check out all the information about membership and see how that works and all the resources available for gardeners there. Again, thank you everyone for coming and attending our workshops. Uh, we still have some more coming up. Um, and there's other ones that you can look in the past at our website. It'll take you to our YouTube channel. You can see previous ones we've done along with other videos that can be very helpful to gardeners. So thank you very much. Thanks, Ben. And yeah, thanks uh, to everybody for joining us. I'll try to have the recording of this uh, up on our website uh, by no later than Monday. So everybody have a good weekend. Thanks.